it's Thursday. You know what that means. Hello there, folks. You join me outside of probably what is going to be the most daunting prospect for me today outside of London Cannon Street because we're going to do what I call the Southeastern Triangle which includes Cannon Street, Charing Cross and London Waterloo East. It's not going to be easy because uh, every time I've done this they've, uh, they've had a bit of a rep reputation for uh, let me do one but then not let me do the other and then any time I go it's the other way around between, uh, between the two stations certainly between Cannon Street and uh, Charing Cross but we're going to start here at London Cannon Street so I think it's time we go and uh, attempt to get the South Eastern Triangle done otherwise known as the Seventh Circle of Hell London Cannon Street Station was built on the site of where Hansetic Merchant Steel Yards had been based from the 10th century until 1598. The site was proposed in 1860 by the South Eastern Railway in response to its rival, the London Chatham and Dover Railway, extending a line into the City of London as far north as Ludgate Hill. The station was opened on the 1st of September 1866 at a cost of £4 million. In today's money that's £394 million. The original building was designed by Sir John Hawkshaw and John Wolf Barry and was characterised by its two Christopher Wren style towers, both 23 foot square and 135 foot high, which faced onto the River Thames. The towers supported an iron train shed 700 feet long and crowned by a high single arch, almost semicircular, and of glass and iron. The station was carried over Upper Thames Street on a brick viaduct 700 feet long and containing 27 million bricks. So uh, here we are on uh, Cannon Street now, all simple and uh, happy with uh, how it's uh, gone so far. To give you an idea of where we are geographically, um, behind me over my shoulder, uh, there's the Shard, there, so that's, uh, that's London Bridge. Uh, you've got, obviously you've got the London Bridge there as well, Tower Bridge uh, in the distance, uh, I believe no, that might be a bit too close, that uh, see the church there, church uh, over there, that might be St Paul's Cathedral, but I think we're too close, I think that's actually the other way, uh, Pickford's Wharf uh, also here as well, over the other side, uh, you see the glass little structure that goes across uh, the, the river there, that's London Blackfriars, and I think, you see the concrete like structure over there on the far that side that's where we're going next that's London Charing Cross over there because it's really weird because we call it the South Eastern Triangle but really the triangle is actually Cannon Street, London Bridge and Charing Cross but you include Waterloo East because you include London Bridge and the Thameslink project anyway oh City Beam has arrived that's good Upon its opening, Cannon Street was a stopping point for all services to and from Charing Cross, including boat trains to continental Europe. A shuttle service between the two stations ran every 20 minutes and became a popular way of travelling between the city and the West End. However, the opening of the District Railway as far as Blackfriars caused traffic to decline, and its extension to Mansion House the following year reduced it further. The South Eastern Railway's route could not compete with the Underground, which was more direct and more reliable, but suburban traffic to Cannon Street remained popular, and the bridge was widened to 120 feet in the late 1880s, allowing 10 tracks with sidings. 
The rebuilt bridge was opened on the 13th of February 1892. In preparation for redevelopment, the remains of the train shed roof had been demolished in 1958 and Barry's Hotel, which had been used for offices since 1931, soon followed in 1960. The architect selected to design the new building was John Paulson, who was good friends with Graham Tunbridge, a British rail surveyor whom he had met during the war. Paulson took advantage of this friendship to win contracts for the redevelopment of various British rail termini and paid Tunbridge a weekly income of £25 in received in return building contracts, including the rebuilding of Waterloo and East Croydon stations. At his trial in 1974, Paulson admitted that shortly before receiving the Cannon Street building contract, he'd given the Tunbridge a cheque for £200 and a suit worth 80 quid. Nice! Also, I should mention the uh, the traction you get out of here at uh, Cannon Street Station. 376s for the suburban routes. 707s have also joined the fleet as well. They're starting to sporadically come over as uh, more 701 <coughs> 701s uh, with Southwestern start to uh, come into service. Uh, you do get 465 and 466s here. You get the odd 375 as well I did see one we did see one uh, Joe in here but it's very very sporadic that you get the 375s uh, mainly I think they, there is a Cannon Street Ramsgate later on so uh, that could be uh, that could be what that's for but uh, other than that it's just yes suburban commuter stuff your networkers Desi cities and uh, your other networkers here on the 15th of February 1984, it was reported in the Times that Cannon Street was to close. At the time, the station had been closed for weekends and evenings, and the publication of British Rail's new timetable for 1984 and 1985 revealed it would lose all of its direct off-peak services to the south-east. Services from Sevenoaks, Orpington, Hayes, Dartford, Sidcup, Bexley Heath, Woolwich, Lewish and Greenwich would instead terminate at London Bridge except during peak hours. This was denied by British Rail manager David Kirby, who pointed out that it had invested £10 million in redecking the railway bridge and that passengers travelling from the southeast during off-peak hours would most likely be visited the West End and not the city. Oh, too sick. Uh, well, there we go, Cannon Street. Tick me. Now we're off to Charing Cross. Oh, this isn't going to be fun. As much as Ian respects the MMC, he doesn't want the MMC today. Sorry, MMC. Oh, Boris. LT423. Take me to Charing Cross. Mind that. It is now time for part two of the Southeastern Triangle. Oh boy. London Charing Cross Station was designed by Sir John Hawkshaw and featured a single span wrought iron roof, 510 feet long and 164 feet wide, arching over six platforms on its relatively cramped site. It was built on a brick arched viaduct and the level of the rails above the ground varying up to 30 feet. The space underneath the line was used as wine cellars. The roof above the tracks is a single 164 foot wide great arch rising to 102 feet at its highest point. The station was built by the Lucas Brothers and opened on the 11th of January 1864. Contemporary with the Charing Cross Hotel was a replica of the Eleanor Cross in red Mansfield stone, also designed by Edward Middleton Barry, that was erected in the station forecourt. 
It was based on the original Whitehall Cross built in 1291 and been demolished in 1647 by an order of Parliament. Owing to its international collections, London Charing Cross played an important part in World War I as the main departure point for both the military and government towards the Western Front. All civilian and public boat services were suspended on the 3rd of August 1914. Return journeys from Dover carried the sick and wounded towards Charing Cross and hence to hospitals across the country. Over the course of the war, 283 journeys departed from the station and on the 26th of December 1918, shortly after the war, the United States President Woodrow Wilson met King Charles V at London Charing Cross. By the late 19th century, London Charing Cross was seen as being inconveniently placed, and in 1889, the newly formed London County Council's John Burns proposed that the station and its approach should be demolished with a road bridge put in place. The idea gained support within the council as it would allow the Strand to be widened and put a road crossing over the Thames that could bypass Whitehall. When the SCR went to Parliament asking for an act to strengthen the bridge in 1916, Burns suggested the station was in the wrong place and should be rebuilt on the south side of the Thames. The following year, an act was passed to reconstruct the bridge with strict conditions about its appearance and a ban on enlarging the station building itself. The booking hall and ticket offices were modernised in 1974 with electronic ticket printing first trials at the station in 1983. In 1986, redevelopment began over most of the area above the platforms. The new buildings were named Embankment Place, a modern office and shopping complex designed by Terry Farrell and Partners. This development led to the replacement of almost the whole of the 1906 roof with the rear two spans of this structure immediately adjacent to the existing concourse route retained as part of the enlarged waiting area. In addition, the original retaining side walls of the station which once supported it remain in near complete condition. The works were completed in November of 1990 and most of the embankment place complex is office space with a selection of restaurants on the ground floor. Uh, right folks, just finished up uh, London Charing Cross, uh, which is the, the busier of the two terminus stations in South East and have in London. Well, I say that, can you really count St Pancras? I don't think you can. Uh, it's got six platforms and yeah, honestly, I got some surprises here this, this day. We got uh, 707s, we got 37s, anything 376s is still called into Charing Cross, but uh, obviously they do plenty of uh, 465s and uh, whatnot, 466s as well, and 375s, that's the staple here at uh, Charing Cross. But uh, we're going to leave now on the next available train, and it's the final part of the South Eastern Death Triangle. London Waterloo East. That one should be easier, I think, to deal with than these two. But to get Cannon Street and Charing Cross done in the same day. So we're just on the 375 sets that we're on now. He wished me good luck with Lord Waterloo East. Is that not be good?
So to give you an idea of where we are with uh, Charing Cross, uh, there's London Eye. Big Ben and the House of the Parliament being bowled by a 45. Thanks there, we're a networker. Uh, what's over the other side? You can't really see much over the other side of uh, importance. Because that over there is uh, all Aldwych. Thank you very much. There's the uh, London Eye and the uh, House of Parliament over there, and Westminster as well. So that's how close you are to Victoria, if you think about it. There we go. Right, now if I remember rightly, the office is around the corner. Hello, 377511. I think this office is one or I think it's this building. I think. They put in a new entrance. Interesting. London Waterloo East Station was built by the South Eastern Railway after the line to Charing Cross opened in 1864. The company were under pressure to connect with the London South Western Railway services as it would allow the latter to connect to the City of London via Cannon Street. The London and South Western Railway, however, were not interested in making Charing Cross a joint station, but were amenable to providing a connection with the South Eastern Railway next to Waterloo. Then, folks, here we are, Waterloo St East Station, London Waterloo East, operated by South East and with four platforms to its name. This is sort of the bottleneck uh, between London Charing Cross and London Bridge. Uh, you can change here for London Waterloo, which is over that uh, footbridge at the distance, and then down another little uh, footpath to get to Waterloo. You've got London Bridge over in the distance, you can see the Shard, that's London uh, Waterloo, and that's about it, really because it's just the same as Charing Cross. So here for 30 and then we're up. I'm going to try Waterloo. Well, no, that'll be the end of it, won't it? When the South Eastern Railway opened the line between London Charing Cross and Cannon Street in 1864, it was frequented by prostitutes who discovered the journey between the two stations was sufficiently long enough to service clients whilst paying minimum rent. After Waterloo East opened, the frequent stopping of the trains there made this impractical. The original Waterloo East Station was built with two platforms, both 530 feet and 440 foot long and 18 feet wide. The waiting room and ticket offices were housed in arches underneath the line. The bridge connection from the main Waterloo Station included a movable platform which allowed platforms to drop directly into Waterloo East when trains were not running. It was mounted on a four-wheel truck which could be easily moved out of the way if a train needed to come through. This connection ran until January 1893 when it was discontinued because of overcrowding. Motherfucking bench at Waterloo? No! Oh, well, you know I'm taking this then. Screw you. Screw you all. The Southern Railway renamed the station Waterloo, also known as Waterloo Eastern, on the 7th of July 1935, and it took its present name, London Waterloo East, on the 2nd of May 1977. The platforms were designated platforms A through D at the same time. Pedestrian access from Waterloo Main Line was replaced by a current high-level covered walkway in 1992. The site of the original rail link, which had been out of use since 1916, was then demolished. Uh, 
there we have it. Three stations, three victories. I think we can call that an absolute success. Hopefully you like the Southeastern Triangle. If you did, leave a like. Don't forget to subscribe if you're not already done so. I don't know which terminus is going to be next. But, uh, yeah. I'm absolutely exhausted. So, uh, thank you all. Hope you enjoyed. I'll see you all next time. We kick back and reminisce Thinking about the dumb shit I did Growing up, maybe a bitch But I keep on going cause I know I can do this I was born a baby